Hi everyone, I thought it would be helpful if I popped on here. First of all, happy Sunday. I thought it would be helpful if I popped on here to give us a quick recap of the Iranian attack on Israel. We're gonna to talk to Ian Bremer. He's the founder and president of Eurasia Group. It's a political risk research and consulting firm. He's also the founder of G Zero Media, a digital media firm. And we thought I thought it would be helpful. And you guys, let me know if this is helpful. I just got back from New Orleans from a wedding, and um, obviously I've been following this story all weekend. Hi, everybody. And so we thought it would be helpful to get Ian to kind of just basically give us a quick primer. It's not going to be a long conversation, but hopefully it'll be helpful to you all to understand what happened, why the Iranians attacked Israel at this moment in time. Hi, everybody. Here he is. Hi, there Ian. I am. Hey. Thank Thank you you so much. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, Ian. You know, I wanted to just do a quick sort of primer for my followers um, about what happened, why, and why now. So basically, I wanted you to just, this obviously wasn't a huge surprise. People who I've been talking to in foreign policy circles said they expected, they anticipated this would happen. Can you talk about the event? that made so many people say it was just a matter of time, Ian? Well, I, I, let me take you back a few months ago uh, because we've seen this now play out a couple of times. Um, I remember uh, talking to some uh, White House officials about the thing that was giving them nightmares in the early weeks of the war. They said, if we end up with American servicemen getting killed by proxies in the region, that's our nightmare. That's what that's what's really keeping us up at night. And then it happened. Then we had um, some proxy attacks um, from uh, Iranian supported militias. And you're talk what what do you mean when you say proxy attacks? I want this is really for like yeah. a, an audience that isn't steeped necessarily in foreign policy issues. I got it, Katie. Uh, we're talking about groups that are not states. In most cases, they are like the Iranians, Shia. Uh, they're military type organizations that get intelligence and money and training and weapons from the government of Iran, from the military of Iran. And there are a number of them. Um, you have groups in Iraq and Syria, not a part of the government. Um, you've got a group, the Houthis in Yemen, that are pretty well known. They're pretty autonomous, so the Iranians don't have operational control of what they do day to day, but, but they're giving them real-time information and weapons, and so they are very aligned uh, with Iran. Is, so Iran, is Hezbollah one of these proxy organizations? Absolutely. Hezbollah is the strongest of them in Lebanon, and Hamas, to a degree, even though they're Sunni and not Shia, have also been a kind of the, the most distant the most independent of the Iranian proxy groups. And together, they form the so-called axis of resistance against the United States and against Israel um, and against the occupation. And they, they don't recognize Israel's right to exist and all that kind of thing. So here you have Iran and the United States are not involved in a war directly, right. but, but they are providing weapons to the enemies of each other, right? And they, so there is clearly a lot of fighting going on. And the Americans, with all of their troops on the ground, with bases in the region, including in Syria and Iraq, they're very worried that they're going to get hit by an Iranian proxy group, not by the Iranians directly, but by a proxy group. And if those people get killed, then how are the Americans going to respond? So that happened. That happened. In, in Jordan, and a base in Jordan, just across the border from Syria, and three American servicemen and women, young, um, you know, enlisted in, in the armed forces, were killed. And, and everyone was like, oh my God, now we're gonna have a war. And, and what the Americans did, because they really didn't want a war with Iran, um, is they waited. They waited for a week and they gave a bunch of information about what they were going to do back channel to others in the region, including, for example, Iraq and Turkey, and saying, look, we're gonna engage in serious strikes against a lot of these proxies, and we're gonna do it in a few days. 
which gives the Iranians a chance to get their people out, right? Um, and also, they made it very clear, if this happens again, like this is a red line killing American troops. If it happens again, we're going to hit right. you. And, so and, what did they do? Is this when they hit the Iranian uh, embassy in Damascus? No, this is when the Americans hit the Houthis really hard in Yemen and degraded, they believe, about destroyed 30% of their known military capabilities and also went after a, a lot of the proxy troops, military targets in Syria and Iraq. Killed a lot of people, but not a single Iranian died. Um, and, and, you know, so there, there's a lot of activity going on. The Americans and others were involved in, you know, a significant fight. The U United Kingdom was involved. There was a lot of support, uh, you know, sort of logistics support from countries in the region like Bahrain, for example. And when did that, but, that, when did that happen, Ian? That was about, I want to say that was about a month and a half ago mm -hmm. now. And the reason okay. I'm, I'm bringing that all back to you and all of your, your fans and all of your followers is because... We just saw almost the same thing happen again, but this time it was the Israelis that engaged in the first strike, and then it was the Iranians that felt the need to engage in a serious hit back, but they didn't want a war to break out. So now let's look at what happens in the more recent uh, time, right. where the um, Israelis see that there is a, um, a, a, a senior Iranian leader from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps on the ground in Damascus. And he is in an Iranian government building right next to their embassy. And they launch a, a missile strike that is meant to assassinate him, to take him out. And they succeed. And they kill a few others as well. Again, an Iranian official building. It's not in Iran, but it's, it's there in Damascus in Syria. And why did they do that? They did that because they see um, these proxies as engaging in war against Israel. They, they see them, they, they, they know, they see them as terrorist organizations. Did they have any intelligence that made them a more immediate threat? Or was this just a show to sort of all these various proxy groups, don't mess with Israel? I, I think it's the latter. It is a, a, a message that if you, Iran, are going to provide direct weapons and intelligence to our enemies who are engaged in terrorist activities, we will find them, we will kill them, and you will not be able to defend that. And the so Republican the Guard, we should just explain, is sort of the elite military elite. unit of uh, Iran. I thought uh, of Iraq or Iran? Of Iran. Iran. Of Iran. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Okay, and so, so, they, so they took out this. This is the most significant hit on the Iranians since the end of the Trump administration, when Trump ordered the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, who ran the Iranian Defense Forces. So this is a very big deal. They are super embarrassed. They look really weak, and they clearly feel like they have to do something. They have to hit back against Israel, but they really don't want a war with Israel or war with Israel and the United States. And the Americans are warning them, don't you dare hit the United States. If you hit us, that's it. Like we are, we are gonna be all in war with you, Iran. Well, so what do the Iranians do? The Iranians wait a week and they tell the Iraqi government and they tell the Turkish government, here is what we are planning on doing. Here is when we intend to do it. We're not going to hit the Americans. We are going to hit Israel. And we're going to use it's going to be a significant set of strikes with drones and missiles. Now, those governments then pass that information on to the United States, who assuredly passes most of that information, if not all, to Israel. And that's why the Americans said the, send the head of CENTCOM to Israel to coordinate defense. That's why the Americans can get ships and planes pre-positioned to be ready to defend Israel. That's why Biden comes out and says, we have intelligence that they're going to hit. It's going to come sooner, not later. Biden says that. That's why you hear from Biden consistently and his people that there is an ironclad American assurance to provide defense for the Israelis. And so then, after a week has passed since the Israelis engaged in this hit on Damascus, 
Iran engages in direct strikes. That's what we saw over the weekend. A well, you know, you were saying it, it was sort of a response. And, you know, you were saying it, it was, wasn't enough to draw Iran into a wider war, but it was still pretty significant. 170 aerial drones, yep. 120 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles. Yep. So, um, you know, that doesn't seem like, hey, we're just kind of sending you a message. I mean, if it weren't for the Iron Dome and the fact that other governments, um, you know, tried to, to knock these things down before they hit the ground. Oh, my God. Uh, Would this have been was a pretty serious yes. pr ser a military action, wasn't it? Correct. Correct, Katie. So what I would say is that, again, I'm, I'm trying to explain what the Iranians think they are doing. Um, they are trying to display a maximum uh, amount of force while at the same time, a minimum likelihood that that force leads to further escalation that precipitates a war with either Israel or Israel and the United States. That's what they are trying to do. Now, Katie, that is a hard thing to do. I was going to say, talk about threading a needle. Well, that, that's, that's why there was so much information provided in advance that they knew was going to get to the Americans. And they knew that the Biden administration also really didn't want to see a war. Uh, the Biden administration was also sending a lot of information, don't you dare attack us. But you know, you could almost, if you're Iran, you could see that as, okay, as long as I'm engaging in strikes against Israel and I'm telegraphing them, and I'm not hitting civilians, I'm only targeting military targets, you can see how the Iranians might convince themselves, hey, this is gonna work out, and by the way, as the Iranian missiles are heading towards Israel, uh, and, and even before they all get knocked down, the Iranian mission to the United Nations in New York publicly says, hey, this is a retaliation. We consider this closed. This is all we're going to do. So from the Iranian perspective, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with the Iranian perspective, but you do want to understand it. You want to know of what course. they think they're doing. They are sending every possible message this is a response. We don't want a war. We don't want to engage with Israel. We don't want to engage with the United States. But Katie, I mean, I've got to tell you, when you're launching a few hundred missiles and drones, like even if you, you know that Iron Dome exists, not like that's a surprise to Iran. Right. You know that the Americans and the UK are there and are going to make efforts to shoot them down. That's not a surprise. And you know you're only aiming at the military. But you know, you could have accidents. I mean, what happens if a bunch of them do get through? What if there's a technological problem on the Israeli side? What happens if, you know, you get shrapnel, they, they fragment, you hit them and they break down and, you, you know, God forbid it hits a school and a bunch of Israelis are dead. I mean, there, to be clear, there is, even if the Iranians, and I feel quite confident that the Iranians did not want this to escalate, but they are playing with fire. I mean, the potential for this to escalate was real and you know now we can talk about what we think is going to yeah, happen next and all the rest let's I'm, talk about I'm just that trying to give all of your viewers no. the best possible understanding of what is going on here and the fact that the iranians literally mirrored mirrored what the americans did previously in their responses was clearly clearly orchestrated so so that they thought they could minimize the likelihood this goes bang in okay. their faces okay this was very helpful to set the stage we should mention that uh, the Israeli military, along with its international partners, intercepted about 99% of these launches. So what could have been a terrible situation was really pretty uh, significantly mitigated by the fact that all these things were intercepted. Yeah, all right, we should, so, by the way, we should add, yeah. right, that I mean, um, for all of the people out there that say that Israel is facing existential threats, the fact is, and this is widely known by the military community, that Israel has by far the most effective military in the region, right? So, I mean, when you look at Hamas's capabilities of hitting the Israelis, the shocking thing about October 7th was just how much the Israeli government and military was asleep at the switch, how much Prime Minister Netanyahu and his, his far-right coalition government had taken you know, many of the Israeli defense troops and taken them out of Gaza and moved them to the West Bank because they're expanding right. the territory that they have and there's increasing fighting on the ground and they're responding to that. They have the best border security in the world. They've got incredible intelligence on what's going on. So watching what's happening over the last 24 hours 
in Israel's response to Iran. Like that is the military that everyone has come to know and expect from Israel. They are incredibly capable. This is well before we talk about like their air force. It's well before we talk about their nuclear arsenal, for example. So if, you know, the, the Iranians, part of the reason the Iranians really don't want a war with Israel is because they can't stop Israeli weapons coming into Iran or Israeli espionage or, God forbid, major Israeli strikes the way the Israelis can stop the Iranians. Okay. And that's an important point, too. Yeah. Let's talk about how this changes the whole dynamics of what is going on over there. Um, I think I read a, a tweet that you had put out about uh, kind of galvanizing much more sympathy toward Israel as a result of this attack. Can you just talk about how the impact of this and how you see it changing things from Capitol Hill, the international community, and other aspects of, of what's been going on over the last six months? Well, from Capitol Hill, uh, it makes it easier uh, to get the money through for both the Ukrainians and linking it to support for Israel as well as Taiwan. You're not going to have as many Democrats now caught up on the idea that you're giving Israel money because of what's happening on the ground in Gaza when you, they just faced this unprecedented strike for Iran. And, and that makes it easier for Speaker Johnson to get this vote that Senate's already approved and you get your 60 billion for the Ukrainians and you get more money and more defense support for the Israelis too. I think that that is a, almost a layup at this point. And it's been incredibly difficult to do for the past couple of months. Now, more broadly, um, I, I certainly there's going to be more sympathy for Israel, but it comes from a low bar. The Israelis are quite isolated outside the United States on the global stage. The U.S. is the principal ally of Israel. You saw that Jordan was providing support for Israel, the U.K., France, but around the world, most countries are still focusing on, on Gaza. They're still focusing on the civilian you know, deaths in Gaza. And so I, I, but I do think that it makes Netanyahu stronger. Uh, he is just seen as very successful in, in leading a country that is responding to this extraordinary threat. And that makes it harder to take him out. So it's much more likely he will be there. Um, in November when Biden is facing re-election. It also makes it harder to get a deal in the near term with Hamas. It makes it harder to get, you know, sort of the, uh, the ceasefire, a temporary ceasefire in return for these hostages. Why? And that means that, uh, well, because um, Hamas, with the Iranians now striking Israel, um, is feeling like they've got a lot of cover. Like, they're not under a lot of pressure from the Iranians to have to, like, give up anything for Israel. And if Israel's gonna respond with a strike, even if it's small, all the more so. So the focus is less on Gaza today and it's less on that engagement. It's much more on Iran, which also means, you know, have with all of the support that the Israelis are now getting from the United States, if it turns out that Netanyahu goes ahead with strikes on Rafah as he intends to, and yes, he allows more humanitarian aid at the margins. And yes, he provides some kind of plan to get some of those people out. So he tries to say that he's, he's responding to what to the red lines, the ultimatum that has been put to him from the Biden administration. But I think that he will feel like he now has more flexibility to more cover to go ahead and do that than he did before these Iranian strikes. Can you talk about what's happening in Gaza now? Because while all the world is paying attention to this latest Iranian action, probably attention, you know, the news cycle is so fast, and it'll go back to Gaza and what's happening there. Are the Israelis letting in more uh, humanitarian aid? And I thought they had at least lowered a lot of their, or, or um, Dec decrease their military action and what was going on in Gaza. Can you just take, keep us up to speed or, or get us up to speed on what is going on in Gaza right now? Yeah, Katie, there, there are far fewer troops, Israeli troops in Gaza now than there were a couple of months ago. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one uh, it is because of the enormous pressure they were getting from the United States. Two is because, um, you know, Israel's not a big country and their economy is suffering. And, there's and, a huge and also, fight. they need more soldiers, need right? More That's soldiers. why they 
Passed and, and that law a, saying Orthodox Jews had to join the military, right? The, the ultra Orthodox would no longer have uh, their ability to um, to uh, avoid um, that service, and that was a huge fight, right? Uh, between uh, Netanyahu with the far right, his coalition partners, that he needs to stay in government, saying that they support that, they oppose that strongly, and Benny Gantz, who he needs to keep in the war cabinet, but not a member of his party saying, if you don't go ahead and end those suspensions and make these people fight, I'm going to leave your government. I'm going to leave your, excuse me, I'm going to leave your war cabinet. So you know, Netanyahu has been under an incredible amount of pressure, both externally and internally. So what, now, what's um, happening, so Ian, sorry, what's happening yeah. in Gaza right now with humanitarian aid and with, with military I'm, action? But more aid is getting through. It is still considered inadequate compared to what they had pre-October 7th. That's not only in terms of the number of trucks, but also because there's no infrastructure in Gaza. There's no government in Gaza. There's nobody that's capable of getting ensuring that it actually gets to the people. Not to mention the fact that lots of Gaza is still a no-go zone. So, I mean, plenty of people are actually suffering from and dying from famine at this point. We're well beyond the point of no return on that front. Now, militarily, there's very little ground fighting going on, but there's still a lot of airstrikes that is happening um, with the Iranians trying to continue to take out tunnels as they find them, also take out members of the of, of the Hamas militias, fighters. The Iranians, uh, you meant the Israelis, the, right? The Israelis, the you, Israelis. You said the have, Iranians, oh, sorry, but I think yeah. you meant the Israelis, the, yeah. The Israelis, some 30, 40,000 targets that they have across Gaza in terms of fighters. Um, and of course, they're trying to find the Hamas leadership. And you saw they were able to take out, you know, a couple of the kids um, of the political leader um, of, of Hamas, uh, but he who himself is outside of the country, outside of Gaza, the territory, uh, but, the, but the kids are not, and they were involved in the fighting. Uh, but most of the leadership of Hamas at this point, of course, is still on the ground or more likely underground. Um, and there's no one in Israel that is supports ending the war until they are able to ensure that Hamas is removed. And that is a very tall order that we are not close to right now. I want to just end by asking you about the political ramifications of this. Obviously, it's a, an election year. It is very tricky for, you know, I was just reading an article in the Times this morning about the Democratic Party uh, pushing the Biden administration because there is this uh, surge in pro-Palestinian sentiment in this country, and it's not just solely on college campuses anymore. Right. So, and then you've got, obviously, this uh, an important election, the re, you know, re-election of Joe Biden or the election of Donald Trump. Uh, they're very much neck and neck in the polls. I guess the most recent one, Biden was closing the gap between him and Donald Trump, who seemed to be a few points ahead. So how does this affect domestic politics in your estimation? Well, one, oil prices are about 90 bucks right now um, a barrel, and they're probably going to go up a little bit uh, Monday when the market opens uh, because people are concerned that this has makes it more likely that Iran will get involved in the war. Uh, also, because there was uh, an Iranian uh, effort to uh, to take over uh, an Israeli-linked ship just next to the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, and remember, I mean, you know, whatever you think about inflation, gas prices tend to have the greatest impact um, on how people think about the economy, how people think about who they're going to vote politically. But is this going to be a temporary uh, upswing, or do you think this is going to be long-lasting? Oh, I, I think that this war is continuing. I think the war in Hamas against Hamas and Gaza is continuing. And I think that even though we're not in a war footing between Israel and Iran today, we have not resolved this problem. The Iranians are still going to have uh, proxies in Syria and Iraq and, and in Yemen. And the Israelis are still going to look to take them out and maybe even deep inside Lebanon too. And all of that, especially now that the Iranians have put the Israelis on warning that, you know, next time this is going to be a lot bigger, right? I mean, on the one hand, you can say they created some deterrence. On the other hand, they haven't actually fixed the problem at all. And so as this war continues, the potential that oil could go a lot higher 
which really would have an impact on the elections. That's a very big deal. So you're so, saying, I mean, that's saying that would be, that would, that would hurt Joe Biden. Much so. so do you, well, obviously, but do you think, you know, uh, I saw Donald Trump tweeting that, you know, we need a strong leader. It was kind of weird because some people were questioning the fact that he was addressing Iran and he's not president of the United States as somehow it was, uh, you know, I think, upending, I, what's the word even, Ian, that it was basically going around the president in a way that is not only inappropriate but and unethical, but perhaps illegal. I don't know how, you know, your thoughts on that, but does this help Joe Biden or hurt Joe Biden? You say gas prices. Does it help Donald Trump because people think, you know, he's more sort of in your face in terms of foreign policy? I'm not sure that Trump is seen as better on foreign policy per se. Uh, I mean, certainly he's, he's definitely seen as tougher on the border and immigration has been a more proximate concern for Americans than any other foreign policy issue for the past months. Um, you know, he's more of a concern on the future of the state of democracy in the United States and Biden has tried to weigh in on that. When we talk about the Middle East, Look, I think one thing that Trump has had going for him is his continue to say, um, we didn't have any new wars starting under me and under Biden. You've got Russia invading Ukraine um, and you've got, you know, Israel at war with Gaza. And no, the Russians wouldn't have done that if I was in power and the Iran Iranians wouldn't do that if I was in power. Um, you know, I, I, obviously he's arguing the counterfactual we would never know. It is certainly true that Trump has been much more willing to engage directly with enemies of the United States to see if a deal could be found. He did that most clearly with Kim Jong-un. Right. And even though we didn't have much of a plan, there was an agreement basically on a freeze for freeze where the Americans froze their military exercises with South Korea. South Koreans found out about that on CNN, by the way, which wasn't great. Um, and the North Koreans froze uh, their ballistic missile tests. Um, and those have restarted, both have restarted um, with the Biden administration. So, I mean, arguably, um, we are in a more tense, more dangerous place vis-a-vis -vis North Korea today than we were at the end of the Trump administration. Now, on Iran, the Iranians engaged in many strikes against U.S. allies, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and also against American bases with, with a lot of American servicemen and women getting injured. And and Trump actually played those down because he really didn't want to use U.S. force against Iran. He was very reluctant to engage in strikes. Now, when he finally did, the strike was spectacular. It was the killing of this fellow Soleimani that we talked about before. And, you know, the reality is that the Iranians backed down after that, thinking, my God, this guy's crazy. We could really get involved in a war. And you know, Trump, whether you think he's smart or stupid, he was president of the most powerful country in the world. And if you're sitting at a poker game and you've got the big, the biggest stack of chips, you know, your ability to get other, other players to fold is pretty high, irrespective of how great a player you are, right? So um, I, I think we, we were seeing some of that play out. And I think, I think that from Trump's perspective, I think he actually believes that to a degree, but it's also clearly useful to him because as you say, you know, the, the Palestinians, are actually, their position is more popular among Democrats than the Israeli position today, which is quite striking. It's quite a change. And of course, it's very different from where the Republicans are today. This is a hugely tribalized issue inside the United States. At some point, I wanna ask you about China and Russia's role with this, because, you know, it just gets, it's quite a web and it gets more and more complicated the more you dive into it. But I know you have a, have other things to do. No, let's come and, back and do it, Katie. I love yeah, talking to you, so I'm yeah. very happy. Well, I appreciate it, Ian, because it's really hard to to parse out all the different dynamics at work and the different interests. So thanks a lot for spending some time with us on a Sunday afternoon. My we pleasure. appreciate it.